As we come to this time of sermon, uh, will you join with me in prayer? Bind us together, Lord, bind us together with cords that cannot be broken. Bind us together, Lord, bind us together, Lord, bind us together in love. Amen. One of the traps that the church falls into in its preaching of the Bible is to paint the person of Jesus as kind of a post-Jew. That is someone who was raised in the Jewish faith, but who was rather more woke about everything and who saw the world and saw humanity in a much more sophisticated way than his own home community. (coughs) Excuse me. This lends itself to anti-Semitic views in the church when we assume that when we follow Jesus, we are similarly much more woke, more sophisticated in thinking and theology than those backwards Jewish people. Think about the normative way that we read the Gospels. Jesus following Jews, great, they've got it. Pharisee Jews, Sadducee Jews, Zealot Jews, unenlightened fools. Gentiles, gross. These are unconscious biases that shape how we read the stories of Jesus and the people around Jesus. But the truth is that Jesus was fully and completely a Jew, living and interacting as a Jewish man. Mary and Joseph raised Jesus to be a man of Jewish faith, to attend synagogue, to listen to rabbis, to follow the Torah, and so on. And the thing to remember is to be raised as a Jewish man at the time of Jesus, when Jerusalem was under the rule of Rome, so was under occupation, to be raised Jewish in that time was to be raised to be proud of one's Jewish heritage, you know, to to really own it in the face of oppression. But the longer that Jesus' community was in that situation of oppression and subjugation, the more they would have self-identified, I guess as a way of comforting themselves, as God's chosen, God's beloved, worthy of God's grace, which therefore meant that non-Jews, that is Gentiles, were the polar opposite of all of those things. That effectively is racism. Race is a social construct that people use to organise social life and it exists everywhere and has existed for a really long time. The concept of race is one way, sorry, is the way that one community structures their material relationships, their economic, social and political relationships on the basis of skin colour. It is part of the way that different societies value some bodies over others, and allow some bodies to have more privileges than others. Men more than women, white skin more than dark skin, able bodies more than disabled, and yes, Jew and Gentile. In Jesus' time, one way that this played out was around adherence to laws around who Jews can and cannot eat their food with. These laws were crucial components of their attempts to maintain their distinctive Jewish identity in their increasingly pluralistic Greco-Roman world. And of course, once you start to define yourself in that way, it is a really short step to then seeing yourself as superior to those around you, as belonging to God's favourite people, and therefore to seeing others as inferior, as rejected by God, and therefore to be shunned and avoided by us chosen folk. That is the set of understandings that the Syrophoenician woman in today's story speaks into. This Syrophoenician, that is foreign woman, comes to Jesus not seeking food, but seeking help to heal her daughter who is tormented by a demon. And Jesus pays her no attention while his disciples urged him to dismiss her as you might dismiss a mosquito. 
Jesus tries by saying that his ministry is only to his own people, but this does not placate or shame her enough for her to leave. And so then sharing food, being such a major symbol of the boundaries that separated her as a foreign woman from him as a Jewish man, becomes the metaphor for the negotiation of their relationship. And so we hear Jesus say, it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. Yikes. It is offensive. It sounds shockingly offensive to our ears, but really it probably wouldn't have raised an eyebrow at that time in that context. The understanding was that the gifts of God are for the chosen people of God. And those gifts that God has given were dishonored if they were shared with people who were not worthy. That is the outsiders, the excluded, the excommunicated, the not us. I've heard many, many sermons on this passage, and most of them inevitably try to defend Jesus' words and actions in today's story. He was just testing her, some will say. For me, it's a little bit the equivalent of not all men in the movement, you know, around violence against women. Not all men, not Jesus. Don't say Jesus was racist. We love that guy. Don't cancel on him. Maybe he was just having a bad day and a mindless moment, and maybe he thoughtlessly repeated a common saying that he was taught, explicitly or otherwise. Look, it's possible. As I said, Jesus would have been raised to give thanks to God every day that he was born a Jew and not a Gentile. Maybe he was simply testing her. It's impossible to be sure, but actually that's not the question that I want to dwell on. I want to go in a different direction today. At the beginning of last year, January 2020, who can even remember back then? I preached on the day of mourning, which is the uh, the Sunday before Australia Day or Invasion Day. It's the day set aside by many churches at the requesting of Australia's First Nations people on the Sunday before our National Day to mourn the continued oppression and discrimination that we see against Aboriginal and Islander peoples. In that sermon last year, I encouraged us all to identify with Jesus in the story, which is usually a lovely feeling, a pretty heady, ego-boosting kind of feeling. We're like Jesus, but not this time. Our primary school curriculums, our federal laws, our Centrelink and our Dole systems, our healthcare systems, and much more, place us as second peoples as chosen, superior, more worthy, more useful, or in the words of Animal Farm, more equal than First Peoples. Subconsciously or consciously, we are raised to give thanks for white Australia, for the opportunities gained through colonisation and the flicking away of First Peoples as we would a mosquito. We are complicit in or actively promote systems that place us in the land of opportunity and a fair go and place first people somewhere else, out of sight, out of mind. And if we do think about maybe changing these systems of oppression, more often than not, we consider first peoples to be as kind of victims that we need to save by our mercy and our charity as people incapable of learning, as childlike, needing to be looked after, as people at the bottom of the great chain of humanity, to be treated with kind of curiosity in the same way that we treat kangaroos or platypuses, poor, dirty, uncivilised First Nations people. I said that in that sermon last year, we, all of us, identify with Jesus in this story and that is not a good thing. I still hold to that and so I wanted to remind you of that. But today, here's a different perspective. In this, as, as in this season of creation, we reflect on how we relate to the rest of God's created world. Here's a different perspective. While we might act as Jesus or friends of Jesus, disciples of Jesus in today's story, the whole Christian church is actually the Syrophoenician woman. When we identify ourselves in this story with Jesus 
or with disciples of Jesus, we join the church throughout history in our supersessionist habit to confuse our subject position in the story of God. When we imagine ourselves standing as Jesus or with Jesus, we look down upon the foreign woman with superiority, at best a sense of charity, and at worst a sense of disgust. And it is that posture, that superior posture, that has led us down the path of racism and adhering to the racial scale, seeing all non-white people particularly dark-skinned people, as people to look down on, to subjugate, to enslave, to discriminate against, as people who can serve us in our privilege. And the worst way that the rubber has hit the road in this thing is that the work of theology in the church, in the history of the church, the work of understanding who we are and whose we are in the church somehow became abstract and theoretical and and orthodox, and by orthodox I mean sort of correct theology or right theology, floating above our real identities and our places and our stories and, and everything that makes us who we are. And so theology became a tool to order the world in terms of racial superiority and inferiority, Uh, capitalist expansion, human labor and evangelism, all of that from a place that we think thought of ourselves as Israel. So from a place of Israelite privilege. That is how slavery happened and continues to happen. That is why people entirely invisible to us make our clothes and our coffee and our food for far less than a living wage. That is why the Stolen Generation happened, Apartheid happened, Jim Crow happened, the Northern Territory Intervention happened, radically different rules for Southwest and Western Sydney were forcibly enforced during our heightened lockdown as compared to Bondi yesterday or the Northern Beaches or so on. But we, the church, we are not that. We are the foreign woman. We are not the people of Israel. The whole point of the gospel is that we stand outside of God's chosen people, pleading for the salvation and the deliverance that Jesus offers. Our basic identity as Christians should not be as people standing next to Jesus as superior, but as people on our knees, like this foreign woman of a sick child. Our posture should be on our knees before Jesus, not not sort of standing next to. We, the church, are Gentiles who purely by chance, purely by God's grace, have sort of overheard and therefore received the gospel of Jesus. We are not Israel. We are not the replacement Israel. We are not the new Israel. We are are foreigners who, by the the magnificent grace of God, have been welcomed to the banquet feast. All of us have been welcomed to the banquet feast from the outside. So, my hope, friends, is that in realising or recognising or remembering this, we gain or regain some humility in where we stand in the world that we gain gratitude for everything that we have received and that we can think about how we relate to other humans from the perspective of the dog. So, for example, if we are really not Israel, but we are in fact the foreign woman, how do we think effectively about the land that we occupy? As the child of migrants, my sense of place, my sense of land is complex. I, in fact we, live on land where sovereignty was never ceded, with a really difficult history relating to immigration and multiculturalism. Alongside that, the land that my parents migrated from, which is the north of Sri Lanka, 
is only now starting to recover from a civil war between my people, that is the Tamil people, and the majority Sinhalese people. And that, that war was about land rights and sovereignty. I live and work on a land that I don't feel like I belong to, nor it to me. I am very much an outsider, living in peace and in safety thanks to the, perhaps, undeserved welcome that my parents received from Australia some 40, almost 50 years ago. So for us, as a church, how do we grapple with the land that we all occupy personally and communally? How do we grapple with uh, problematic historical connections that the church has had with land ownership and, in fact, capitalism? And with the redevelopment of this church property still on the way, how do we keep faith, do justice, and build community humbly without a sense that we deserve this land or are owed this land, this building, these property resources? Here's another. If we, the church, are the Gentile woman, how might we effectively talk about and help to dismantle systems and practices of racism that, and it, I swear it really is this simple, arrogantly places the creators and the supporters of the racial scale as the most perfect of God's creation, correlating their skin tone with reason, intelligence, civilization, goodness, creativity, while literally looking down on others, dark-skinned others, correlating their skin tone with unreason, ignorance, savagery, depravity, and mimicry. How might we, the church, do this really hard work of discerning how we respond to Christ's great commission to evangelize, to go into the world and make disciples of all nations without being white saviors? By white saviors, I mean people going into foreign lands with the inherent assumption that white people hold the gospel and it is by their, it is by our, magnanimous generosity that black and coloured others might receive it or a kind of twisted version of it. If we, the church, are the Gentile woman, how might this affect our day-to-day -day individual lives and our choices as disciples of Jesus in terms of the clothes we wear, the food we buy and eat, the things we invest our time and our money in, and so on? If we are the Gentile woman, how does that affect every decision that you make every day? But above all of this, if we, the church, are in fact the Gentile woman, my prayer is that our collective work of theology, our collective efforts in the work of theology, is transformed. The idea that theology can be abstract or theoretical or in some way orthodox is grounded in untruth. It's just not legit. All theology is contextual theology. But those who have been in, in control of the theological agenda and the arenas of theological study, that is, white men, have usually forgotten this, claiming their thoughts, their reality as universal and excluding all other voices. All theology comes from perspective. All theology comes from experience and is shaped by various lenses that we all have. So I am not at all interested in, in forming young disciples at Leichhardt Uniting Church with an understanding that there is only one correct theology, which is our theology. Because that idea has regularly been a tool of colonial, racist, Israel-minded oppression. I am much more interested, as one of your ministers, in resourcing collective, contextual theological work, 
shaped by really diverse experiences of God, of Jesus, of the kingdom of God at work here, and of the church, really diverse experiences that we all hold. Part of that work is, of course, pointing you to the great minds of our past and our present, and honouring the radical discipleship legacy that we inherit here. But part of my role is also to draw your attention to feminist and womanist and queer and liberation and other theologies and readings of scripture. Our collective theology here is enriched by each one of you. Culturally diverse, gender diverse, sexuality diverse, age diverse, education diverse, and so on. This season of creation, our theme is the Lord God made them all. Humanity in the web of creation. So today, as we prayerfully consider how the church, how we the church, we the privileged, we the largely white, interact with the rest of God's humanity, the invitation upon us all today is to reorient ourselves away from seeing ourselves at the top of humanity's own pyramid, with all the answers to life's questions to be shared charitably with those who don't know Jesus, but rather to see ourselves in the church as part of a web of humanity, maybe as part of a body, like the body of Christ. Maybe the body of Christ is much larger than the institutional church, since through Christ, We all, we all the foreign women, are welcomed to the banquet feast. And barriers of race, sex, wealth, age and education and much more are broken down in Jesus. How then shall we live, my friends? How then shall we live our race, culture, faith, wealth and privilege differently? We begin our services and all of our meetings with an acknowledgement of country. We have a statement on anti-racism, which you can find on our website. We do our best to buy fair trade. We try our, you know, we do our best to buy ethically sourced products like our t-shirts. And these are all really good things that we can do. But the demand is on each of us, both individually and collectively, is how do we live as humans within a web of humanity, not a pyramid, but a web, against the structures and the powers of white supremacy and new Israel superiority? How do we live in that way and in so doing bear witness to the kingdom of God? Amen.